So, we've been going at it for two weeks, and this is our third week. Lord, I pray that you just give us the ears to hear what you're saying to the church. Father, help us to absorb your word, and not just absorb it in our brain, Father, but to get it in our spirit, man, where we can actually put it into practice and allow fruit to come forth from your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we've been talking about I Am a Church Member, based on the book by Tom Rayner, Dr. Tom Rayner. And one of the things that we talked about when we first started this a couple weeks ago is the tale of two church members. And I'm just going to briefly summarize where we are right now. We're going to jump into our next chapter. The tale of two church members. We had one church member who thought of the church as like a country club. What can you give me? What can you give me? Ha, you can give me prayer. You can give me a nice meal on Sunday. What can you give me? The other church member came to serve. He was a functioning church member. He came to serve. And so we learned by going through that first chapter that we are to be a functioning church member. In order to function, you need to know what your gifts are. You need to know what God has put in you. Amen? We also talked about in chapter 2 that we need to be a unifying church member. Not just someone who's functioning, but someone who is actively bringing unity to the crowd. Not coming in with, you know, the schisms of I like this and I don't like that and arguing and fussing about everything, but coming in to bring unity within the body of believers. Now, I'm going to ask again, as I did last week, how many of you did your homework? All right, we have more hands in the air. Woo! Write this down if you still have not read 1 Corinthians 12 through 1 Corinthians 14. Please take time to do that. That was your week one homework. Those chapters talk about the spiritual gifts, about the body working as a whole, a part of one another. Chapter 13, most of us know chapter 13, the love chapter talks about how we are to walk in unity as servants to one another and knowing that the more excellent way is love. Amen. I have a question. Who would like to volunteer? All right. How about Josh and Mike? Joshua and Mike, would you please come here? Yes, you. We miss you. We want want to um, have a little demonstration, if that's okay. If you'll face the congregation, and Josh, you stand right beside him. Face the congregation, and if you would tie this around your two legs, like you're getting ready to go do a potato sack race, you can just tie it, just one little loop there. All right. Yeah, you can tie it tight if you want. <laughs> awesome. Oh, boy, you never get it off then. Make sure you can get it off, okay? Now I tell them after they've knotted it. You might not get loose. Hey, it's okay. I have a knife in my pocket. (laughs) All right. Yeah. So you and you are in agreement, and you can walk together in a straight line from there to here because you're in agreement, and you're walking together. Together. (laughs) All right, now stop. But wait a minute. Mike now wants to sit there, and Josh wants to sit there. They can't both have what they want in this case, can they? What has to happen for them to actually be... You can just take your foot out. I won't have to take out the blade. So what would have to happen for them to to sit in those, those two places? You sit there and you sit there. They have to be divided. Did you guys see what just happened here? If this church is going anywhere, anytime quick, we have got to be bound together in unity, walking step by step. If there's any divisions among us, we need to make sure they're gone. You can have a seat in your fun chair now. (laughs) Thanks. And this goes for the body of Christ. I'm not just talking to the Shield of Faith Church. I mean, I see a lot of unity. I see a lot of growth in myself and everyone here. We're not pointing fingers just at the Shield of Faith Church. This whole lesson came about over a year, a year and a half ago. 
and God just recently released us to, to bring it forth. So, Now, for those of you who did read in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14, did you run across this scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, 25? And this is what it says. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. The same care. Like, I'm not going to take better care of Mike than I would Aunt Shirley. I'm not going to take better care of, of Rachel than her mom. We already have the same care, the same concern for every single person in the body. Now, when I looked up that word schism, it was very interesting, needless to say. It means a split, a gap, a division, or rent. You know, not rent like you pay to live somewhere, but like the curtain was torn and rent. It is a primary verb meaning to split or sever break, divide, open, rend, or make a rent. In that scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, there should be no schism in the body at all. No division. Well, I agree to disagree. Is that a good attitude? You know what? It's okay. We agree to disagree. And we love each other. We have no ought against each other. It's okay. And we walk arm in arm away. Not, yeah, I agree to disagree. <laughs> and laugh about what they're sharing their heart about. Right? Raise your hand if you did homework from week two. Do you know what that was? The spiritual gifts assessment test. Raise your hand if you did it. Okay, it takes a while. Good job, Josh. It takes a while to get through that test. You may need to sit down and go through one page and the next day go through the next page. If you have not gotten a copy, let me know and I'll make sure you get a copy. I did print them off and bring them. <laughs> I will make sure you get a copy, hon. <clears throat> it's really important that you take time to do this test. Let me, let's go ahead and show you this first page. You can't see it really clearly up here. But on the first page, this is where you would write your answers to the questions, like you're scaling you know, on a scale from one to five and you give yourself a, a rating. And then you total up each column, and based on which column has the most points, that's how you can identify what giftings you have. And then on the sheets that are attached to the packet, you can actually find out more about the gifts, the qualities, the positive qualities about that gift. But you also will find out the cautions about that gift, things that you need to be aware of. And all these gifts you'll see listed on that page in the definitions of those. And you don't need to write all these down because they're on the copy that I'll give you if you haven't gotten it already. But these are the multiple giftings that are identified through this test. Now this week, I gave you that little rundown. The first week was, I am a functioning church member. Second one, I'm a unifying church member. We're on our third week. And we're actually going to do two chapters today because I believe they go hand in hand. The second one, the third, and the fourth kind of all blend together very nicely. Chapter three, I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. Now, last week we talked a little bit about unity. We talked about how important it is to keep out all disunity, all strife and dissensions, things that keep us apart and one of the things we talked about was in Judges. And how many of you remember the story of the Midianites and the Israelites? Now, the Israelites were taken by the Midianites. And the Israelites would come and they would plant their seeds and have these wonderful harvests. And then, when the crop was ripe, you know, they planted all these seeds. The stuff is beautiful. Then would come the Amalekites and the Midianites with all their camels and all their people, and they would ravish the entire countryside, take all their food, destroy everything. And so the Israelites were scared, and they were running to the hills, in the cleft of the rock somewhere to hide because they did not want to be attacked by the Midianites. And what we learned by that story last week is that we ourselves can plant seeds in many ways. We can be out there planting seeds by ministering to people, praying for people, leading people to the Lord. We can be out there planting our own 
our money, planting our seed into people's lives. So many seeds we can plant. But guess what? The Midianite there say goodbye. Do you know what the word Midianite means? You guys remember this from last week? Contention, quarreling, brawling, discord, strife. We can plant seeds all day long, but if there's contention among us, there's no harvest. There is no harvest. It's gone. So God looks at this, the disunity and us wanting our way so much as a very serious thing in the body of Christ. How many of you have had children or have children now, but I want to do this and I want to do that, and they start arguing because they're just not in unity? Anybody? Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. That was, there's a whole story that he wrote in this book that I would like to get to in just a little bit. Now, last week we also talked about, well, how can we stay in unity when we have an issue about something? We had these pictures of words posted all over the church, whether it was the temperature of the church or the tithe and offering or praise and worship or the flowers or whatever. We had all these posters all over the place to show us some of the things that the body of Christ might argue about. Well, we're going to show that again briefly for those of you who, who missed it. Say here's our issue that we're discussing. Pastor Bob and Willie, would you mind being my, uh, my guinea pigs this time? <clears throat> I'll let you get this side. I'm on vacation. Oh. <laughs> if you would like to sit down, I will call on someone In else. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so they have a discussion about money. Or not, I, no. I, I really thought for one second I might, but no. So here's their conversation going on about money. They're in balance, you know. It's quite even. But they're on two different sides of what this is about. Say it's tithes and offerings. He might think, oh, tithe 10%, give your offering 10%, and that's it. This guy over here says, well, I tithe when I can. I have kids, or I have a family. And if I have enough offering, and so they start arguing, and they start tug-of-warring over the money. You know who's going to win, right? <laughs> God says no. God says no. You guys, you can argue about this all day long, but you know what's going to happen? Discord comes in, yeah. and then there's an issue in your relationship with each other. And then hurt feelings. <laughs> And hurt feelings. Hurt feelings. Yeah. So, then people get sick. there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. Right. There's a disagreement about this. Mm -hmm. But don't pull the string. Don't tug on it. Don't try to get your way because I think my way is the best. It's okay. Right. You just let it go. Amen? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> So it's okay to have a disagreement, folks. There's nothing wrong with a disagreement. Be angry, but sin not. It is a very serious thing when we get into an argument. 1 Corinthians 13. Love hardly notices. It does not hold grudges, and it will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. Hardly even notices. One of the things that I had to be very careful of with my children, you know, Miss Type A, everything gets done. You guys know me better than myself most of the time. I had to be very careful because I would get too hard on my kids. Well, you need to do this, and you need to do that, and nope, that's not done. You've got to move this here or move it. Mom, can we just do something fun? Do we have to do this right now? And so we have to be careful that we're not so focused on fixing everything, but that we take time to relax and enjoy God's presence, enjoy the people that are in your family. You know what? My husband was given to me by God. He is one of the most laid-back people on the planet. All right, I have a lot of shaking heads out there. 
if my granddaddy taught me, now you rinse those dishes off. If you're not going to wash them, you at least get them rinsed because you don't want no bugs crawling up in your house. You know, my husband could care less if the dishes are piled in both sides, not that it gets that bad. But I take time to spend with him and my children. Those dishes will wait until they're in bed and God gives me the strength to get up each morning after I'm up doing dishes. Or I can do them in the morning while they're eating their breakfast. We have to prioritize what is priority. What is priority? Please do not go home and say, well, Michelle said I didn't have to vacuum anymore. I don't have to do those dishes. It's not like that now. Come on. I might knock on your door one day. So we need to be prioritize things and not be so focused on fixing things all the time. One other thing, this is total sidebar, whenever I was in, um, in Bible school, one of the things that they taught us is it's great to sit down and study, but if that's all you're doing is studying and you don't have yourself a Bible that you can just read just to read, then you can get out of balance. You need to be able to just relax and read the Word without having your strongest concordance and dictionaries and the you know, all that around you. You need to be able to relax. And the Love Bible is perfect for that. I love the Love Bible. I laugh because David, every time we go to Texas, he sees Love's gas station and he says, I love Love's. So yeah, I love the Love Bible. All right. I would like to read a little bit of an excerpt from this particular chapter that we're looking at from Dr. Tom Rayner. It's very interesting, and again, we're talking about, I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. <clears throat> Often, I'm tempted to use illustrations of my children in a various settings, since I have such a love for my three sons. Even now that they are adults with their own children, I sometimes find myself talking about them when they were little boys. So I thought I might begin this chapter by giving an illustration about my boys fussing and fighting because they wanted something their way. But then I began to think how many times I fought with my older brother because I wanted it my way. Right now, without compromise, nobody's like that. I could be a selfish brat. It's good we grow out of those phases after we become adults, right? It's even better that we never revert to that after we become Christians, right? Well, Christians can sometimes act just like those demanding children who want things their way. Temper tantrums in churches may not include church members lying on the floor, kicking and screaming, but some come pretty close. But the strange thing about church membership is that you actually give up your preferences when you join. Don't get me wrong, there may be much about your church that you like a lot, but you are there to meet the needs of others. You are there to serve others. You are there to give. You are there to sacrifice. Get the picture? Jesus would often say things that confounded his listeners. You see, even his disciples had a tendency to fight with one another. On one occasion, the twelve were arguing about who was the greatest. Can you imagine that? The closest followers of Jesus was having a me-first fight. The Bible says that Jesus stopped, and he sat down, and he called these grown men together. Sitting down, he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all, servant of all. Ouch. He said ouch, not me. I would have loved to have been a fly on a cloak and seen their expressions. Yep, he got you this time, you self-serving disciples. And then it hits me. That text is for me as well. As a church member, my motivation should not be to get my preferences at the top of the list. I am supposed to be last, not first. I am supposed to be a servant instead of seeking to be served. Okay, let's dig a little deeper into what this means to be a servant. Jesus said we must be last of all and servant of all. That doesn't seem like all the church members we may know. Many church members demand their preferences, their desires, and the way they're always, they've always done it. But Jesus said we are to serve. 
We will never find joy in church membership when we are constantly seeking things our way. But paradoxically, paradoxically, we will find the greatest joy when we choose to be last. That's what Jesus meant when he said that the last will be first. True joy means giving up our rights and preferences and serving everyone else. And that's what church membership means as well. Amen. And that's the way you get set free. That is the way you get set free. Amen. Let's look in the Amplified. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. And we have three verses we're going to look at here. Do nothing from factional motives through contentiousness, strife, selfishness, or for unworthy ends or prompted by conceit and empty arrogance. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, lowliness of mind, let each one regard the others as better than and superior to himself, thinking more highly of one another than you do of yourselves. Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interest, but also each for the interest of others. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. So we are to have the mind of Christ. But what was the mind of Christ? Number one, he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Did he? Go ahead, Willie. It's okay. So he didn't consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. The other thing is, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave. Of a slave. And we'll get these up here for you to be able to look at them. He did not consider equality with God right here. For those of you who are writing. The next screen. He humbled himself. Again, we already have the mind of Christ. He became obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. What part of Jesus died on that cross? His flesh, his desires, his preferences. How many of you remember what he said in Luke? How many of you remember the prayer he prayed to the Lord in Luke 2? 22, I'm sorry. Luke 22, verse 42. He said to the Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of divine wrath from me. Yet not my will, but always yours be done. He gave up his preferences. He gave up what he really, you know, he didn't really want to go there. But he said, my will is to do the will of the Father. He gave up his preferences for us and his flesh died when we sacrifice our desires and our preferences we are putting our flesh down and we are allowing the holy spirit and the lord to have his way amen Amen. am i telling you something you haven't heard before i know a lot of you have already heard this jesus did not push his desire on the lord He didn't push his preference. Well, I want it this way. I want it that way. He was simply expressing, Lord, if there's a way, let this cup pass. But if not, you know, I'm going to do your will, Lord. Mm -hmm. Did not push himself. Whose will is more important to us? Here's how we can tell whose will is more important. We're having a conversation, and all of a sudden, I say to you, you know what, I don't really want to hear what you have to say. What happens on the inside of you when someone says, I don't want to hear what you have to say? One of two things is going to happen, and this will reveal your level of maturity. Well, I... 
You know, that, that part of you is like, I've got something to say. Okay? That part of you that rises up, that's your flesh. Flesh is flesh. It doesn't matter whose bones it's on. It's going to act the same way. Which is going to be stronger, your flesh or your spirit? Whichever one you're feeding. That's right. Who you feed more. Now, if I say I really don't want to hear what you have to say, and you look at me and say, okay, God bless you, and you really are okay on the inside, that's maturity. Yeah. That is a person that's yielded to God, that is confident in who God has called them to be, and they don't need man's approval. They don't need someone patting them on the back. Oh, I really care about what you're saying. It's wonderful. Oh. They're confident in who they are. And it's okay. Amen? Amen. All right. So we have gone through our chapter three on being a church member and realizing that it's not about our preferences and our desires. Let's go ahead and stand and take our third pledge. Each time we have a chapter, everyone stand. Each time we have a chapter, we have a pledge that we say at the end. And it, tr it, it is geared towards helping us to identify with what we've been taught and to come in agreement with one another. So let's read this together. I am a church member. I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. That is self-serving. I am a member in this church to serve others and to serve Christ. My Savior, the next screen. <clears throat> my Savior went to a cross for me. I can deal with any inconveniences and matter that just aren't my preferences or style. Amen. You may be seated. In this second chapter that we're doing today is chapter four. And I think this is an extremely vital chapter in our book. Chapter three was, I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. Well, chapter four, I will pray for my church leaders. I will pray for my church leaders. Now, all church members, if we'll go to the next screen, will you? All church members are happy, right? No. 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 Okay, well, let's look at the next one. Let's see if we can uh, figure this out. Oh, they're all crazy. <laughs> no, they're not crazy. This is probably more like what church is like right here. You got some that have the halos on that never did anything wrong in their life. You've got some who look shocked with their eyes bugging out of their head like they just, you know. You've got some who are kind of below the guy with the glasses who are looking at everything else and not really focused on what's going on in the world. You've got people who are crying because they're laughing. You've got people who are crying because they're sad. You've got a mixture of church members. Think about the pastor or the leadership who is taking care of those people. Many of you in here have counseling sessions in your homes on a regular basis. People walk in, they're in the hot chair, you pray for them, and then they're gone. It is a lifestyle of leadership and ministry. Now, I'm going to read pages 43 through 46 in this book so you can get a little bit of an idea. And this tore me up when I read this. First time I read it, I can't remember how I responded, but man, when I read this a second time, this just really tore me up because it's reality been there. So here's the story. It's Thursday morning. Pastor Mike has a clear calendar, an aberration in his busy schedule. Actually, the calendar is not really clear. He has set aside some time to finish his sermon for Sunday. His Bible is open, study aids are nearby, and he begins to study, and the phone rings. His assistant tells him about a car accident involving a family in the church. The ambulances are already on the way to the hospital. Mike leaves all of his study material on his desk and he jumps into the car. On the way to the hospital, his assistant calls him again. The entire Godsey family of five were in the car. None were seriously hurt except Gary, the father, and the husband of the family. 
and his condition is grave. Pastor Mike walks into the emergency room, and the family has just been told that the husband and father did not make it. They see their pastor, and they run to him, sobbing and in total shock. Mike is there for them. He stands with the entire family and stays there for three hours until he is certain that enough people are there to take care of them. He stops by his home to see his wife, and he grabs a quick sandwich, and it's now afternoon. He's not sure if he can return to his sermon preparation, but he knows he has to do that. He must fight the emotional exhaustion of the morning and finish the message. But as he walks back to the church, his assistant apologetically tells him that two people need to speak with him. They consider it urgent. Mike, Pastor Mike, meets with these two men. One of them is the worship leader of the church, and he is struggling with his ministry and is considering giving up. For two hours, Mike listens, consoles, and attempts to encourage the staff member. The next visitor then catches Mike off guard. George, who is one of the key leaders in the church, comes to visit. Mike considers him a friend and an incredibly vital person in the overall leadership of the congregation. George struggles to speak. My wife is having an affair. There are no more words for five minutes, just tears and sobs. Mike stays with George for over two hours. They pray together and talk about next steps. It's nearly five o'clock in the afternoon. Mike is too drained to attempt to get back to his sermon. Instead, he begins to look at his crowded email inbox. He cringes when he sees one of the senders of an email, but he cannot stop himself from opening the message. It's from one of Mike's most frequent critics in the church, and she has two complaints. The first irritation was something he said in last Sunday's sermon. The second complaint addressed Mike's failure to visit her sister-in-law, who had minor outpatient surgery yesterday. The woman is not a member of the church, and Mike knew nothing about the surgery. But still, she's upset. Pastor Mike shuts the laptop cover, moves to his car slowly. He'll stop by the house to grab a quick bite to eat, and then he needs to check on the Godsey family. He will stay with them for a while, but he must leave prior to 7.30 when he is to give the invocation for a local high school basketball game. Several people corner him at the gate so he doesn't get home until after 9 o'clock. He goes to a small study in his home, shuts the door, and begins to cry. Gary Godsey, the father and husband who was killed in the accident, was Mike's best friend. This was the first chance that he had to grieve for his best friend. And we think we have it hard. Being in church leadership is not easy. I started in church leadership when I was 18. I had no idea what I was getting into. As the head over a Sunday school, like many different departments, and it was very difficult. Oh, what's she doing? She's 18. How can she be? Oh, and she's a, a woman. Can we trust her? It was, it was awful. You would never believe some of the things that come across that people say. Now, one of the things that we have to do is know our church leaders. Know who they are. Know what they do, what their responsibilities are. Now, I'm going to go through the list. Most of you know who the leaders are. Most of you are aware of the leadership. Most of our leaders are here today. Please don't get upset if I don't mention a job that you have, or anything, this, the list is extensive. If I stood up here and noted every single thing that every single one of the leaders do in this room, we would be here until midnight. It, it's just, we function here. We are servants, definitely servants. We know Pastor Bob and Susan as the pastors of the church, elders Frank and Linda, and I mention the husbands and wives together respectfully because they're in the ministry as much as the other is. Amen. Right. 
Now, you know Frank leads with the sound up here. Linda, she does a lot of the decorations for some of our events that we have, and she is very active in serving and making sure people have food when they're ill or anything. She's always there. Deacons, Rick and Missy Knoffel, church cleaning. Rick heads the video lead up there, and, he, and they also manage the family night that we have here every second Friday of the month. Deacon Willie Preston, who's up there doing the the videography now. He's also the head of the groundskeeping. If you need something to do, call Willie. I'm sure he would like for you to help him do this amazing property that we have. Lots of work. He also helps with counting of the offering. Mike Wolf does as well. Worship leader and youth pastor Michelle and Floyd Dotter. Minister and youth leader Doris and Larry Cook. Minister Willie Tillman Jr. How about Naomi Pro, how do you say her last name? Provo. Provo. She was ordained the same time Willie was. She's a minister here at our church. I, I, I look at, a, at Mike Wolf as a leader in the church. He's our greeter. He's the first person you're going to see when you walk in this door. When he's in town, that's where he is. And he also helps with the accounting of the offering. Praise team. Willie Tillman, Linda Butler, Naomi Pro, Provo. There's some things I just... It just won't click. I'll, I can tell speeches here and there, but give me, is it French? Provo. Like Provo, Utah. Provo, Utah. Okay. <laughs> Rachel Ferguson. I've got Floyd Dotter's name on here. And it got quiet. Elisa Wetzig. Deborah Oliver, Cindy Scott, which we haven't seen in a while, and if you think of her, give her a call. Her name and number is on the, the list. I have sent her a couple of messages, and last I talked to her, she was doing fine. Um, Nicole Stackhouse, Josh's wife, is actually an ordained minister. So pray for your ministers and, your, and the leaders and their families, the children. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I already told you some of the stuff that I've gone through with my kids. And they're dealing with us as ministers at times, like I'm here preaching while my kids are at home doing homework. And one of them has already texted me saying, hey, mom, I haven't been able to finish this yet. I need your help. But he understands I'll be home soon. And so they have to work through things as well as children. Now I'm going to read page 47. We don't have that much left to do. I was a little concerned we may not be able to finish, but it looks like we can. Woohoo! Church leaders worry at times that they neglect their families because of the demands of the church. They worry about their families living in a glass house. Because anybody in their sharp tongues can wound a family, whether it's a church leadership or anybody individually. So they think about that. Pastor Bob and I both have had death threats. We've had people leaving messages on our machine. I've had a gunshot at me. I mean, you have, we have no idea what leaders go through on a daily basis. So that it's very important to pray for their protection, pray for their, their families, for their physical and their mental health. They anguish when critics direct barbs at family members. Now, I know for, for men who are heads of their family and in church leadership, if someone messes with one of yours, if there's any time in your Christian walk that you may lose it, it's going to be when people come against your children or your wife. Right? And so we have to be real careful, real balanced. Balanced. Again, Pastor Bob's had someone call him and basically say they're going to take out his daughter if, if somebody doesn't do something. You know, we have to be in prayer for that hedge of protection. We are church members. We must be the prayer intercessors for pastors, leaders, and their families. Few families face the kinds of pressures and expectations as the families of pastors pray for their families. Let's all stand for our fourth pledge. Again, this is the fourth chapter. I will pray for my church leaders. Let's go ahead and say that. I will pray for my church leaders every day. I understand that their work is never ending. 
Their days are filled with numerous demands that bring emotional highs and lows. They must deal with critics, many from within the church. They must be good fathers and mothers. They must be good husbands and wives. Because the leaders cannot do things in their own power, I will pray for their strength and wisdom daily. Amen. All right, everyone have a seat. Guess what we have for next week? Homework. (laughs) Homework. Write it down. I'm telling you, if you guys do your homework, you will find that this series will just do nothing but build on itself. It'll help you be prepared for next week. And so the homework is going to be to read Philippians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapters 4 and 5. Now, if you have a wild hair and you want to read chapter 6, go right ahead because it goes hand in hand with it as well. But primarily, if you'll read Ephesians 4 and 5. And I am not asking you to do something that I haven't done. So spend the time to read it if you can this week. Make it part of your devotional, if at all possible. And I am really looking forward to the next two chapters that we have. And I've I've really had a great time incorporating some of the things that I've learned through the years in with the chapter and in the book. And um, pray that you guys will be blessed as well. Hallelujah.